electrical engineering drawings, are one of the means by which effective planning of a successful electrical power and lighting projects, depend. These drawings provide a concise picture of the objectives for the electrical system work to be done. It also serves as a record for owners and as instructions and guidance for contractors, electricians, installers, and others performing the work. They also serve as contract documents, that can be used as evidence in court cases involving contractor malfeasance, or failure to comply with the intent of the specifications. The present conformity to accepted formats for drawings and specifications is the result of years of practical experience, reinforced by accepted national and international standards, issued by government agencies and private standards organizations. The standards organizations are advised by experienced personnel from the ranks of manufacturers, contractors, and other interested parties. The intent of standards is to produce, unambiguous documentation, that is understandable by all project participants, from engineers and architects to contractors, project supervisors, electricians, and installers. Drawing for an electrical project serves three distinct functions. They describe the electrical project in sufficient detail to allow electrical contractors to use the drawings in estimating the cost of materials, labor, and services when preparing a contract bid. They instruct and guide electricians in performing the required wiring and equipment installation, while also warning them of potential hazards such as existing wiring, gas pipes, or plumbing systems. They provide the owner with an as-built record of the installed electrical wiring and equipment for the purposes of maintenance or planning of future expansion. The owner then becomes responsible for recording all wiring and equipment changes. A typical electrical drawing consists of solid or dashed lines representing wiring or cables and symbols for luminaires, socket outlets, switches, auxiliary systems, and other electrical devices and their locations on a scaled architectural floor plan of a home or building. The drawings also include title blocks to identify the project, the designers or engineers, and the owner, and change blocks to record any changes that have been made since the drawing was first issued. In any given set of electrical drawing there are also specialized drawings such as One-line diagrams, this shows a three-phase AC system or a two-wire DC system condensed and simplified into a one-line form to illustrate the general arrangement of the system. Three-line or AC schematic drawings. These drawings show all three phases of a three-phase system, including the ground and a four-wire system. Transformer connections are indicated in phase relationships. This includes all PTs, CTs, and power transformers. It also shows how secondary connections to instrument transformers are connected to relays and meters. DC schematic drawings or elementary wiring diagrams, EWD, this shows complete two-line DC circuit including buses, meters, relays, etc. This is sometimes called a ladder drawing with the positive and negative buses placed vertically on either side of the drawing. Connection wiring diagrams, CWD, this is the detailed drawing used to determine exactly how the devices are to be connected. It shows all connections, devices, AC phases and DC leads accurately. There might be no drawing requirements for relatively simple electrical projects such as updating the amperage capacity of a home or extending branch wiring into a basement, attic, or extensions. In these situations, all information needed can be included in a written proposal or other contractual agreement. Device function numbers standardized by the IEEE and updated from time to time are used in many countries. The most prevalent numbers, with its corresponding function name, and the general description of each function is listed here. For more information the relevant standards should be consulted. IEEE Standard C.37.2-1991 More ANSI numbers and letters for standard electric power system devices are listed here. This demonstrates how these device numbers are used in a typical electrical drawing. 21G, related to distance relaying. A relay that functions when the circuit admittance, impedance, or reactance increases or decreases beyond a predetermined value. 24. Overexcitation relay. A relay that functions when the ratio of voltage to frequency exceeds a preset value. The relay may have an instantaneous or a time characteristic. 40. Loss of excitation or field relay. A relay that functions on a given or abnormally low value or failure of machine field current or on an excessive value of the reactive component of armature current in an AC machine indicating abnormally low field excitation. 59. Over-voltage relay. A relay that operates when its input voltage is more than a predetermined value. 87G. Related to differential relaying. A protective relay that functions on a percentage, phase angle, or other quantitative difference between two currents or some other electrical quantities. 
suffix and prefix letters may be added to further specify the purpose and function of a device. Relay identification is usually designated in a fractional configuration. The number in the numerator, B94RTRT in this case, the numbers are significant, depending on the utility requirements, this is an Ontario Hydro, or, now, Hydro 1 standard. B, represents connected to the B battery bank. 94, represents the device function, which is, trip. RT, represents, remote trip. Lower case, R, stands for, receive. Lower case T, represents timer. The numbers in the denominator, RRKN1307, is the manufacturer's, Azia Brown Boveri, relay designation. Sometimes the relay parameters are listed. This relay is rated for connection to, 110 to 125 volts DC and has a time delay range of, 0.05 to half a second on pickup. The coil is the squiggly shaped line, the polarity is indicated with a plus and a minus sign. The normally open and normally closed contacts are indicated, and shown in the, D, energized state. Relaying terminology. Relaying operation. An electromechanical relay is said to have operated, when sufficient current has passed through the operating coil to cause movement of the mechanical components, and move the contacts to open or close, depending on the design and purpose of the relay. For solid-state relays, the relay is said to have operated when the quantity to which it responds has reached the value where the logic circuit initiates action to cause a set of contacts to open or close, depending on the purpose of the relay. Relay resetting. Most electromechanical relays operate against a restraint spring, or gravity, with the result that when the actuating quantity disappears, or is reduced below preset pickup value, the relays will reset. These relays are called self-resetting. However, some relays, once they have operated, will not reset themselves. These are known as manually resetting or lockout relays. Solid-state relays are similar, in that once the actuating quantity disappears, or drops below the pickup value, the logic circuit allows resetting of the contacts. Relay pickup, relay dropout. If the actuating quantity applied to a relay is gradually increased, a point will be reached at which the relay will operate. This minimum operating value is called the relay pickup value. If the actuating quantity is then gradually decreased, a point will be reached where the relay contacts reopen. This value is called the relay dropout value. Pally switches are auxiliary switches provided in circuit breakers and in certain disconnect switches that are linked to the operating mechanisms in such a way that they are opened or closed by the operation of the main device. Those switches which are open when the device is open are called A. Pally switches. Those which open when the device closes are called B. Pally switches. This slide illustrates circuit breaker pallies as they would appear on an electrical control diagram. The number 52 designates them as part of a circuit breaker. Normally open, normally closed contacts. A contact which is open if the relay has not operated is called a normally open contact. If it is closed when the relay has not operated, it is called a normally closed contact. On electrical drawings, all contacts are shown open or closed as they are when the relay has not operated. Symbols for normally open and normally closed contacts are shown. Under certain circumstances, it may be desirable to ensure that once a relay has operated, it remains in the operated position, or picked up for a definite period of time or until certain other events have occurred. In such cases, a relay seal in is provided. A typical seal in circuit is shown here and in the interest of simplicity, only the wiring directly involved with the seal in function is shown. Assume that contact, X has closed. Contact, Y is normally closed. And therefore, the relay, R, will pick up. In so doing, it will cause contacts 1 and 2 to close and contacts 3 and 4 to open. In closing, contact 1 applies DC positive potential to the relay coil. Regardless of whether contact X is now open or closed, the relay will stay picked up. Until contact, Y is opened, thus, de-energizing the relay coil and permitting the contacts to return to their normal position. In this case, the relay is said to have been sealed in. Inverse time and definite time relays. A definite time relay is one in which the time delay introduced remains constant from one operation to the next, regardless of the severity of fault conditions. An inverse time relay is one in which the rate of travel of the moving contact assembly increases with an increase in magnitude of the actuating quantity, that is, the time required to close the contacts decreases as the fault current increases. Graphing the two functions looks like this, where the current through the relay is plotted along the horizontal axis, and the time to operate is plotted along the vertical axis. Drawing Symbols 
Magnetic relays are used as auxiliary devices, to switch control circuits, large motor starters, contactor coils, and to control small loads such as small motors, solenoids, electric heaters, pilot lights, audible signal devices and other relays. A magnetically held relay is operated by an electromagnet, which opens or closes electrical contacts when the electromagnet is energized. The position of the relay changes by spring and gravity action when the electromagnet is de-energized. They are normally used to enlarge or amplify the contact capability, or multiply the switching functions of a pilot device, by adding more contacts to the circuit. Control relays are available in single or double throw arrangements, with various combination of normally open, and normally closed contact circuits. Sometimes the relay coil or the activating component of the relay, is represented by what might look like a resistor. And sometimes, might look like a small rectangle. The confusion is usually eliminated by the close proximity of the contacts and the written relay designation. These are the most common depictions of fuses in electrical drawings. Dummy fuses are basically just conductive cylinders such as copper piping, that are placed in a fuse holder, not for protection but to give technicians access to the potential point for testing purposes. Fuse alarm contacts are used to indicate that the fuse is blown. These are the drawing symbols for controlled lightning arresters that are devices found in high voltage switchyards, or along distribution feeder circuits, that are placed there to minimize the impact of lightning hits. Basically, they don't have any function during normal operations. That is they don't conduct under the assigned voltages of the system at that point. Circuit breaker drawing symbols. Alternating current circuit breakers rated at 1500 volts or less, and for all direct current circuit breakers. 3-pole circuit breaker, with thermal overload device. 3-pole circuit breaker, with magnetic overload device. 3-pole circuit breaker, draw out type. Electrically operated circuit breaker. Single line and elementary wiring drawing representation. Circuit breakers, other than those already covered. The symbols to the right are for three pole breakers. The breaker identification is usually added inside or adjacent to the symbol. R indicates reclosing. SRC stands for reclosing and synchro check. NRV indicates reclosing and no voltage check. These are just some of the figures that are used for rotating machinery. Basically they are similar to what you see at the top, however, some have a sidebar representing the excitation, and further to that, you'll find lettering inside the circle that will indicate more specialization. Keep in mind that manufacturers send drawings around the world, and may take the liberty of using different shapes for rotating machinery, but these are the generally accepted ones. Transformer drawing symbols. Transformer, air core. Transformer, air core, step down. Transformer, air core, step up. Transformer, air core, tap primary. Transformer, air core, tap secondary. Transformer, iron core. These drawing symbols show the same transformers with iron and powdered iron cores. Notice the differences, solid lines, versus the dotted lines in between the coils. Transformers, especially three-phase transformers, can be very mysterious and difficult to deal with unless they're broken down into very simplistic transformers. Whether they're three individual transformers, or a three-phase bank. They can be considered as three individual transformers that are characterized by two things. The excitation voltages. And how the windings of the transformers are connected. Three-phase transformers can be considered for all intents and purposes, single-phase units consisting of a primary winding linked magnetically to the secondary. They become a three-phase unit by virtue of their excitation voltage, and how they are connected to one another. They may also share the same core, but may be considered individually. In North America, they are energized by three voltage vectors that are out of phase by 120 degrees and rotate counterclockwise. Connections for a star or Y-connected primary transformer. One terminal of the primary terminals are connected to the system, lines, buses etc. The other terminals are connected together and form a primary neutral. In more detailed terms. The high voltage, H2 terminals are connected together to form the neutral, and the H1 terminals are connected to individual phase conductors. The vectors or phasers look like this. The star-star connected transformer. The secondary of the transformer can be connected in many ways. Here we will look at the star or Y connection, 
which is the same as the primary, that is, one terminal of the secondary terminals are connected to form the red, white and blue phase of the LV system. The other terminals are connected together and form a secondary neutral. The vectors or phasors look like this. And this connection is known as a YY, or star-star connected transformer. The voltage phasors can also be measured phase to phase and these phasors would look like this. On the primary. And on the secondary. In a delta to delta connection. One terminal of the primary terminals are connected to the system, lines, buses etc. The other terminals are connected to the adjacent primary terminal. The H1 terminals are connected to individual phase conductors. The high voltage H2 terminals are connected to the adjacent primary terminal H1. And these are the voltage phasors. Looking at the secondary side of the transformer, it doesn't matter how the primary is connected, the choice of connections on the secondary side are independent of the primary. In this case we're going to connect it in delta, similar to the primary side. In this case one terminal of the secondary terminals are connected to form the red, white or blue phase of the low voltage system. The other terminals are connected to the adjacent secondary terminal. And this produces secondary voltage phasors like this. Which is known as a delta-delta connected transformer. The last three-phase transformer that we will look at is the start a zigzag or interconnected star transformer. The zigzag name comes from the layout of the secondary phasors, forming a zigzag pattern as you see here. The primary side is usually star connected. By using this configuration the following advantages are achieved. This transformer is used to supply unbalanced, single, line to neutral. And three-phase loads for three-phase four-wire systems. The transformer is relatively free from third harmonic residuals. The biggest advantage however is the fact that although it can supply single phase loads with a neutral on the secondary side, its phase to phase voltages match up with with star delta transformers. There is a 30 degree phase shift from the primary to the secondary, yet a neutral connection is available for relaying and single phase loads. For a star to zigzag, interconnected star transformer, each phase is made up of one single primary winding, and two secondary windings, on each phase. One set of these windings are connected in star as seen here. And not surprisingly the phasers look like this. In order to complete the secondary connections, we will start with the secondary bus bars to which the low voltage side of the transformer is connected. The other set of these windings are connected like this. The red unspotted terminal of the secondary, is connected to the red system bus bar, while the other red, spotted terminal, is connected to the spotted terminal of the first white winding. The white unspotted terminal of the secondary, is connected to the white system bus bar, while the other white, spotted terminal is connected to the spotted terminal of the first blue winding. The blue unspotted terminal of the secondary, is connected to the blue system bus bar, while the other blue, spotted terminal is connected to the spotted terminal of the first red winding. Because of their polarity and hard connections, when added to the existing other coil windings, the summing of the phasors result in a zigzag pattern that you see here. The secondary phase-to-phase -phase vectors look like this, notice that the phase-to-phase -phase secondary vectors are in phase with the primary phase-to-neutral vectors. The theory behind the Y zigzag transformer is explained in more detail in one of my other courses on three-phase transformers. The objective here is basically to show how a Y zigzag transformer would be represented on an AC schematic. This is what transistors look like on a schematic, bipolar, NPN, bipolar, PNP, field effect, N-channel, field effect, P-channel, MOS field effect, N-channel, MOS field effect, P-channel, photosensitive, NPN, photosensitive, PNP, photosensitive, field effect, N-channel, photosensitive, field effect, P-channel, unijunction, triac. This is what vacuum tubes look like on a schematic. Diode. Photosensitive diode. 
Triode. Tetrode. Pentode. Hexode. Heptode. These last few items may also be found on a schematic. Unspecified unit or component. Voltmeter. Wattmeter. Circular waveguide. Flexible waveguide. Rectangular waveguide. Twisted waveguide. Wires, crossing. Connected. Wires, crossing, not connected. The circle on a drawing can mean a number of things. It is usually supplemented by one of the following letter combinations, depending on the function of the meter or instrument, unless some other identification is provided in the circle and explained on the diagram, for example. Ammeter. Demand ammeter. Ampere hour. Oscilloscope or cathode ray oscillograph. Decibel meter, audio level meter. Demand energy meter. Digital recorder, watt meter. And many others. This is just a sampling, but you get the idea. As a final illustration, this schematic will highlight several facts that you might run into in the real world of electrical drawings. This drawing is known as an operating diagram. There are some items on this drawing that you'll recognize right away. But there are other items which don't seem to fit our standard list of components. I will identify these in the next few slides, but before moving on to that, there are a couple of unique features that I want to point out. First of all, every component on this diagram has a unique number or designation. That is important in order to operate the various components and make sure that when an operator walks out into the yard, they can find various labeled items that he needs to operate. These components and identification are a standard that most likely has been adopted by the company that is operating the switchyard. Making the leap from what we have already established as standard practices may seem daunting at first glance but once you get used to working with these differences it's actually a very small step. You are going to find, from time to time, that there will be deviations from standard practices, However having learned and worked with the standard symbols and drawings, the leap to understanding something different will be easy. This station has two, three-phase lines, coming in at 230 kilovolts. The first component that we come across identifies the voltage coming in, these are potential or voltage transformers, VT1 and VT2. Their ratios are identified beside them 230 to 0 0.115 kV or 230 kV to 115 volts. Transformers are sometimes represented by two interlocked circles, representing the primary and secondary. You will see later on that the power transformers indicate their connections, sometimes inside, and sometimes outside the circles. CT1 and CT2 are 600 to 5 current transformers. The circle indicates the secondary or 5 amp side of the CT. The primary is indicated by the single line going through the circle. These are grounding switches that are normally open, but are closed when the line is out for maintenance. Its purpose is to ground the, de-energize line which, could get relatively high induced voltages during the outage. CB1 and CB2 are 230 kV circuit breakers. On this drawing, their depiction is a slight deviation from normal practices in that they are drawn as an ordinary switch but the CB designation beside them indicates that they are breakers, and since they are connected to the 230 kV bus, they are 230 kV circuit breakers. DS1 though DS4 are isolating disconnect switches that are used during maintenance to isolate the lines, breakers or bus. This is an indication of the bus voltage 230 kV. This is the bus voltage transformer, VT3. The ratio is identified beside it which is the same as the line VTs, 230 to 0 0.115 kV, or 230 kV to 115 volts. Moving on down this schematic, let's continue to analyze it, starting from the 230 kV bus. We have the same breaker disconnect configuration as on the other side of the bus, made up of circuit breakers, CB3 and CB4 with DS5, 6, 7 and 8. 
Again the CV designation beside them indicates that they are breakers and since they are connected to the 230 kV bus, they are 230 kV circuit breakers, and DS5 through DS8 are isolating disconnect switches, that are used during maintenance to isolate the breakers or bus. CT3 and CT4 are 600 to 5 current transformers. TF1 and TF2 are the 31.5 MVA main power transformers for this station. They are connected as indicated Y to delta with the primary side neutral solidly grounded. They're in the ratio of 230 kV to 33 kV. VT4 and 5 are potential or voltage transformers. Their ratios are identified beside them, this time because they are on the secondary side of the power transformers, 33 to 0.115 kV or 33 kV to 115 volts. CT5 and CT6 are 2000 to 5 current transformers. CB5 and CB6 are 33 kV circuit breakers. The CB designation beside them indicates that they are breakers, and since they are connected to the 33 kV side of the power transformers, they are 33 kV circuit breakers. The power transformers feed a 33 kV bus. The 33 kV bus is connected by CB11, DS15 and 16. These switches and breaker are normally closed, but may be opened by various protection schemes or when isolating for maintenance purposes. DS11 through DS14 are isolating disconnect switches, that are used during maintenance to isolate the breakers, feeders, or the 33 kV bus. CT7 and CT10 are 600 to 5 current transformers monitoring the current and the outgoing feeders. Click on, show more, to reveal more options. If you use batteries, you're going to want to hear this, because there's a new dead simple trick that anyone can use to bring nearly any type of dead battery back to life again. Once you learn this, you'll pretty much never have to buy new batteries again, and you'll save thousands of dollars on the cost of batteries over your lifetime. It's easy to do, and if you click the link below, you can learn more. So if you're ready to learn how to bring any type of dead battery back to life again, so you can stop buying new overpriced batteries and save money on batteries the rest of your life. Click the link below now. This information, as well as other related electrical blogs, may be found on my website at https colon forward slash forward slash www.getpspt.com. There you also have access to My courses, which are continuously being added to, and at the present time include the following. This ends the chapter, and the course.